the uh, title of this sermon series again. Good. Yes, very good. We are exploring 1 Corinthians chapter 15 through these um, six weeks that will lead right up to Easter Sunday. And we're learning to do what again? Talk about Jesus, because uh, sometimes we like to talk about the man upstairs, or uh, the big guy, or him, or lowercase g, God, and we, we don't get very personal. Sometimes we don't get so excited, maybe, as we should be. We're going to learn to talk about Jesus in a way that betrays how deep and how personal of a relationship that we have with him. So one more time, would you guys say it with me? Talk about now, in today's passage, in the very end, in verse 34, the Holy Spirit says this, Awake to righteousness. Wake up. Wake up. Today we're going to learn how to talk about Jesus in a way that's going to wake people up. And that's important because sometimes we sleep or slumber in regard to the things of God, don't we? Every now and then, we know what Scripture says, we know how we ought to respond, but we're asleep to it. We've fallen into a rut, a funk, if you will, that we can't really get out of unless someone is willing to use their words to shake us and wake us up. And sometimes I'm guilty of talking to lost people about Jesus as if he is a reasonable option. Academically, it makes sense that, and more than that, folks are sleeping, the lost are in a dead sleep, and they need a, to hear us talk about Jesus in a way that's going to wake them up. And during this whole introduction, I've been looking around the room deciding who I want to pick on today. Thank you. But I pick on Donnie. I pick on Donnie every week, I think. So, uh, so David. <laughs> you, David, remember the time that David told us, all of us, when Justin Bieber stopped by his house to use the bathroom? And he, the way he told that story... You're like, he was, he was so excited. He got him to sign all of the, his CDs, which David has. And he was talking about it not like this. Justin Bieber stopped by my house the other day. He was talking about it like this. Justin Bieber came to my, the Beeb came to my house. And now we all have Bieber fever. And he's, look at my CDs. Look at all the CDs. Do you want to touch them? I don't think so. Not these CDs. And maybe with some excitement or some zeal, we could talk about Jesus in a way that's going to wake people up. Because if I talk about him as if, well, <laughs> yeah, there is Jesus, that's not going to do. That's not going to do the trick. Another illustration from real life is that uh, for some reason I sleep really sound and I go to sleep really quickly, like within a minute or two. Sometimes while Amanda's still talking. And then I'm really sorry. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. But I fall. She's used to it now. But in the middle of the night, I will see the strangest things in our room. And I will jump up out of bed, so I'm told. A lot of this is made up. I will jump up out of the bed, and I will say, do you see those hands? The hands. And I was like, what, what hands? What hands? It's been almost 19 years, and Amanda it still scares her to death, and I understand why. What hands? The Viking hands that are sticking out of the wall. She's like, oh, just go to, go to sleep. And then some, sometimes I'll, she tells me I'll wake up and I'll go, what? Who's that? And I just stare, and she's like, who? What? And then I fall right back to sleep, and she's like, And I, I mean, I know I'm the only one that does this in the whole world. 
Some of you wives probably have figured out how you need to speak in order to help your husband go back to sleep and stop crying out, right? And it's usually not, go back to sleep, you're just dreaming. Usually it's more like, oh, go back to sleep! All is well, all is well, go to sleep. It's something that's going to wake him up. But you guys have been in that deep, uh, what do you call that, that twilight. You're not fully awake. You know what I'm talking about? You're, you're not fully awake, you're not really fully asleep, but you're in the middle of this dream, and you're like, wake up, wake up, wake up, the cliff is coming, wake up, wake up, I'm about to fall, and you can't get yourself awake. You know what I'm talking about? You guys know what I'm speaking of. Sometimes we get like that about the things of God. And I can't, sh- I can't shake myself. I can't wake myself. And, and sometimes you can't either. But the best you can do is to at least talk to me in a way that's going to wake me up. So uh, this is what we're going to work on today. Maybe not so much learning how to do it, but learning that we should do it. You guys help me with this. Say this with me. Talk about Jesus in a way that's going to wake people up. And I think there's a couple people a little asleep here this morning including the, the guy on the stage, so I need your help. Say that one more time, deeply, from the very deep recesses of your soul. Help me out. Talk about Jesus in a way that's going to... Yes. You're trying to make us into a bunch of preachers. Exactly. You know, all preaching is... Brian Chappell is a preaching um, professor, scholar of preaching. He said, Brian, Brian Chappell said... Preaching is heightened conversation. If you're in the middle of talking with, with, and anybody can just talk normally about anything, but when you get to something you're excited about, your voice goes up, you show it all over you, and that's the way we need to talk about Jesus. Okay? I see Howie does this. I don't know if you know you do this or not. Howie gets in something he's really excited about. Usually Michelle... But when he begins to share, I've watched him over the years share the gospel. He begins to share the gospel, and it's all over Howie, isn't it? His, his, he changes this and that because he's now he's, he's excited. He's speaking about something he's zealous about. And how many of you think that Jesus has probably changed you to the core? Right? Because m- many, like, many of you like going to Chick-fil-A, but it may not have changed you to the core. So, yeah, you're, you get a little excited about it peppermint milkshakes at Christmas time, but maybe not as excited as you get. You show your excitement different ways. Sometimes we get, we get like this. Sometimes we get like this. But either way, we're doing it with a zeal because Jesus has changed us to the core. He's our Savior King. And uh, one day we're going to answer to him, not to everyone else in the world. So let's, one more time, let's talk about Jesus in a way that's going to... All right, will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just verses 29 to 34 today. 29 to 34, 1 Corinthians 15. And let me get one of you, um, I haven't selected anybody ahead of time, would one of you read this out loud for us, verses 29 to 34. entire camp said amen. Let's pray together, and we're going to have a quiet prayer all over the room. Lord, speak to me. Lord, show me how to talk about Jesus in a way that's going to wake people up. All over the room, let's pray.
someone voice our prayer out loud for us, please. Someone pray for us, please. kind of get yourself your workspace there ready because we are doing personal Bible study we continue to focus on our study of the Bible so get your uh, your pencils your calculators your uh, compasses out and your desk your laptop desktop there let's go to work on this passage and let's mine it let's dig at it and see what it has to say to us you know that chapter 15 is all about the resurrection that's not a word we use all the time what does that mean sorry one more time Jesus Christ rising from the dead and he is the first fruits later who else will rise again all who belong to him right and he, there are people in Corinth who were saying, ah, there's no resurrection of the dead. You don't need that old body. It's just junk. God doesn't care about that. All that matters is your ethereal soul goes to float around in the lights of heaven one day. And Paul says, no, no, no. That's, that's a Greek thought. That's a philosophical thought. That's not a Christian thought. Your body is important to Father God. He created it. And it is important for you to have that glorified, resurrected body. And Jesus' resurrection is the foundation, really, for believing all those things. And so he's been working on that in chapter 15. And we get to this place here, beginning in verses 29 to 32, where the Apostle Paul makes this point. The resurrection gives meaning to our persecution. The resurrection gives meaning to our persecution. Read with me verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord that I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Then let us just eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, if there is no resurrection, then why are we being persecuted? What's the point of going through these things if there is no resurrection? I'm out preaching about Jesus, and one of the main components of the good news of Jesus is that he died, was buried, and they rose and there is no gospel presentation if that is left out of it. And if it is an essential component, I'm out preaching it and people are beating me up for it. Why am I going through all that if there is no resurrection? In other words, resur the resurrection gives meaning to persecution. If it wasn't for the resurrection, why are we getting persecuted? It's a waste of time. It's worthless. It's meaning, meaningless. And he says this in verse 29. And let's start here. This is a difficult verse for some reason. And many people have said many weird things about this verse. Okay, so let's do a little work. Everybody roll up your sleeves. You know, clear your throat a little bit. Put on your thinking cap. Perfect. Here we go. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise why then are they baptized for the dead? Right? There's not enough time to go into all the things that have happened with the, this verse, these two sentences. But just uh, suffice it to say this, some people have taken these two sentences, this one verse, and built a completely weird doctrine on it. 
There's nothing else in the rest of the New Testament about you going to be baptized on behalf of a dead relative. Is that what Paul means? Well, I, you're going to think I'm um, being, I'm using hyperbole here when I say that there are 200 different explanations for verse 29, but I'm not. There are at least 200 different interpretations of verse 29. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And somebody leans back and says, well, I guess it really doesn't matter. Is that what we do? Maybe at, maybe at some other wimpy church you would do that, but what are you guys going to do about verse 29? Well, there's, since there are different opinions about it, then no one can know. There is no interpretation. Is that what we do? No, we pull out our little brown cards, roll up our sleeves, and we do a little bit of work, right? We're not afraid of a little bit of work, are we? We do a little bit of work, and I'm going to do a lot of it for you. And then you take it home, and you decide if this is right or if this is just another one of those times where Trey's making up stuff. But verse 29, I believe, because of its grammar, because of the way it talks in view and connection with the other verses that follow, verse 30, 29 to 32, verse 29 to 32 form one paragraph, if you will, one uh, section of our passage today. And that entire section, I'm going to argue, is concerned with persecution. Okay, now you look at verses 30 and 31 and 32, and you say, well, obviously those are about persecution. Well, I'm going to tell, I'm going to suggest to you that there is no big grammatical break, there is no big thematic break from verse 29 to verse 30. In other words, verse 29 also has to do with what? Persecution. You say, well, what, in the, what, what do you mean? Well, it all comes down to how we understand how baptism fits into this. And I'm going to talk about baptism a bit more in just a second. But here's what he says in verse 29. What will they do who are baptized for the dead? Right here is a Greek word, huper, which can be translated as for, which um, for in, the Eng in English grammar is a preposition. Thank you. So uh, you can think of several different prepositions. But here is another way to translate who pair, because it has a range of meaning. Words have uses. Here are some, here's another use of the way this word is used. Concerning. And I think it will help us understand Paul's meaning if we were to translate it that way here, because the word is who pair is translated concerning in other places. Listen, listen to what I mean. Instead of will what will they do who are baptized for the dead? Instead of that, what will they do who are baptized concerning the dead? Well, that didn't help me much, Pastor Trey. Hang on. If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized concerning the dead? What in the world does baptism have to do with dead people? And you're like, I know what it has to do with dead people. I know what it has to do with two people who died. One, his name was Jesus Christ, and he died. And he died for my sins. And I know what baptism has to do with another person who died. Can you guess who that is? Me. Okay, you guys with me now? You, you're ahead of me. You're ahead of me now. You guys are the, the scholars I knew you would be. Let's talk about baptism for a second. Baptized concerning the dead. The dead here, I, I'm suggesting Jesus Christ, whose death we've been talking about through the whole chapter and phrase yours identity when I was baptized I identified with Jesus' death is that all? and with his burial and that's it see if that were it Trey you wouldn't be here today because ready? I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit buried with him in death Are you with me? Paul's like, that's no good. That's not going to work. Baptism has everything to do with all of it. The death, death, going down, burial, under the watery grave, and help me out. You sure about that? Raised to walk in newness of life. And everybody's like, Whoosh. 
He made it. He made it. The resurrection. Okay, you with me? Tonight, someone's going to be baptized. And those things are going to happen. You're going to watch. This person is not literally dying. They are going through something that's symbolic of what they've decided inside by their faith. I believe that she, I believe on Jesus. And I believe that he went into the grave. I went into the grave. But I also believe, help me out, that he rose again. I'm going to come back up at the same time. And what on earth does that have to do with this passage? Baptism, death. People who are baptized are identifying with Jesus' death, their own death. And when you die to your own life, what is happening? What are you doing? What are you saying? I get a new life, right? But what's the old life that I'm dying from? The old life that who was in charge of? Who was making the decision? But this new life I'm doing what with? I'm submitting it to Jesus. Are you with me? The old life was a life of rebellion against Jesus. I was an enemy of God. But that person is dead, thank goodness, because he would be punished eternally in hell, only to be reborn as a person who's now walking this way and saying yes to Jesus as Savior King. Are you with me? Now, you and I, man, we, were, we're, we live in this world that says, well, yeah, Jesus wants you to do all those things that are going to make you happy. And, but I read these passages of scriptures like we started with in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to do what? Take up your cross. You, you've got to let go of your life. What does Jesus mean by take up your cross? Oh, we've, we've also reinterpreted that. Well, my cross is my, my chronic sinus infection. My cross is my you know, my arthritis, or my, no, it's none of those things. What did the cross mean for Jesus? It meant death, it meant I am on my way to Calvary with you. Jesus, when he said those things, was, was moving from the north, from Galilee to Jerusalem, on the Calvary road. I am going to die. Do you want to follow me there? And most people are like, no. And some people, yes, I do. And Matthew, he makes it very clear. Jesus says, if you do not take up your cross, you have no parts of this. The only people who get this are the ones who see that this is life and it's worth so much that I will walk into the face of death to have Jesus. Now that's what the new life is. That's what this raised life is. It is a life of I will go where you go. I will, I will go wherever you send me. I will talk about Jesus there. If you, you tell me to do it, I will have to say yes to you. And I will say yes to you gladly. That's the new life. That's how Jesus presented it to people. This is what the Christian life is. And Paul took that pretty seriously, didn't he? So now let's go back. Verse 29. Let me give you the expanded Hensley version of verse 29. What good is the death part of our baptism, the part where we die to our own will, the part where we take up the cross and identify with Jesus' sufferings, what good is the death part if there is no resurrection part of our baptism? That didn't fit all right here in my side note. I had to scribble it in down here at the bottom. But I believe that's how we take verse 29. I don't think it's designed to be some new weird practice. I think what Paul is saying here, what good is that whole death part of baptism, the part where we die to our own will, the part where we take up the cross and identify with Jesus' sufferings, if there is no resurrection part to our baptism, that's all worthless. It makes no sense at all. Have I created more questions than answers? I say, I'm good. Let's go. Let's roll on. Let's put the hammer down. Put the hammer down. Persecution is when people mistreat us because we're talking about Jesus. You know, I could say, well, persecution is when people mistreat us for being a Christian. 
but that kind of assumes somehow that I'm just standing around being a Christian. People are mistreating me for it. Now, that's not why people were persecuted. People were persecuted because they talked about Jesus. They believed on Jesus, and they lived their life that way, and they wouldn't shut up about Jesus. And Paul is one of those people. He just won't shut up about Jesus. So because of that, he's persecuted. And if there's no resurrection, that persecution has no meaning. Verse 30. Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Every moment my life is at stake. Why? Why? If there's no resurrection, why? I could be preaching a totally different gospel. Everybody be okay with it. Yeah, Jesus lived, he's a great teacher, and he died. Okay, cool. But I'm saying he rose from the dead, and man, that really offends people. And that's getting me in trouble. And that means I'll also rise from the dead one day. I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm so proud of you. You guys, some of you here at Corinth, you've been persecuted as well. And that persecution is not meaningless. I die daily. Every morning I wake up expecting to die. Every morning I think, is this going to be the day that I finally give up my life and identify with the very death of Jesus Christ? And that's what Paul said his, his goal in life was in the book of Philippians. To share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ and maybe, maybe even in his death, dying like he did. If in the manner of men, verse 32, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? He's speaking figuratively. These guys in Ephesus, they were like a bunch of beasts. Like a bunch of thug creatures. And I fought with them and I preached the gospel to them. And they mistreated me. But if the dead don't rise, I got a better idea. And then he quotes from a Greek uh, poet. Let's just, what does he say? Eat, drink, and be merry. Come on, that's how we, that's our default way of living, Right? Let's just, let's just do that. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's all in the Lord's hands, we say. And we live just like this. Let's just eat and drink and be merry. Because tomorrow we die. Let's just live a meaningless, meaningless life. If there is no resurrection, then go live that meaningless life. Because it's all meaning. Meaning. In other words, the resurrection gives meaning to our persecution. Will you guys say this with me? The resurrection gives meaning to our persecution. Now, do you think this is pretty personal for the Apostle Paul? Yeah, because he's talking about... Apostle Paul says things like this. I'm going I'm to lower my robe, and you look at those scars that are on my back, from the beatings that I've taken, and then you look me in the eye and tell me that there is no resurrection from the dead. Do you hear that? It's designed to be personal. It's designed to be convicting. It's designed to be convincing. The Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit is saying the resurrection gives meaning to all of this persecution or else I've done it in vain. So how in the world can someone among you, who is it? I'd like to know who it is that's saying there is no resurrection. How can you say that? It gives meaning to our persecution. So snap out of it. Snap out of it. He says in verse 35, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. There are people among you that have tricked you and you've just gone right along stupidly. You've just fallen right into the trap. You just were so easily convinced of something that was so incredibly wrong that it'll actually alter the way you live, that you'll no longer live following Jesus anymore if you just continue to be duped by this teaching. Someone in your midst has done this, and you've allowed that, and you so easily gave in to it. That's why he says in verse 34, as we come back to where we started, shaking them in the bed because they're just having this crazy nightmare shaking them snap out of it snap out of it snap out of it 
How can you continue to believe these things? Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. Surprise, there are people among you who do not know God. They think they do, they talk like they do, they're corrupting the rest of you as if they do, and I'm speaking this to your shame. You ought to be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed that you've allowed these people to keep talking. You ought to be ashamed that they're, if they're even still in your church, that they're even there. I speak this to your shame. You, you've just so easily gone after a false teaching that's going to lead you down the wrong path. The resurrection is everything. It's everything. If there is no resurrection, then all this persecution, all this trouble, why am I going through it? It's totally meaningless. So snap out of it. You guys preach this. This is today's sermon in five seconds. Preach it to me. Ready? The resurrection gives meaning to our so. Somebody said, why couldn't you just do that? We could be home by now. That's today's message. And I want us to end uh, the same place that we started. Um, have you ever fallen asleep in regards to the things of God? Somebody says, well, not exactly a sleep, maybe more like a nap, a nice light little Sunday afternoon nap. Somebody says, I'm in a deep coma. But sometimes it's brief. We've all been there. We've all been there. And so our, our hope is that there is still a place where I can go where someone will shake me out of my slumber. And we call that place the church. Where I can go and we'll shake one another. And then you know people who are in this deep coma who are just lost, totally asleep. And they need you to speak to them in a way that's not like that soothing voice. Like, remember your mother, wake up, wake up. And you're like, that, thank you, that helps me sleep the rest of the day, really. Wake up, wake up. They need someone who's going to speak to them in a way no one else does. A way that's going to wake them up. So that's our takeaway. Help me out with this. Talk about Jesus in a way that's going to wake people up, not make them fall asleep. Stay. In just a moment, um, we're going to put up a slide on the screen. Actually, let's go ahead and do it. It's an invitational slide. You saw it last week. But it's just some things to consider. I don't know how the Lord is working in your life. I just pray that he is. My job is um, sim similar to the job of the prophets. My job is mostly to get you off the fence. If I preach right, then someone will get off the fence. And they'll get a, either go on this side or this side. One way or the other, I've done my job. So I'm hoping, and I, I'm hoping that with this invitation... Whatever fence you find yourself on right now, that today you'll hop off of. And I hope to hop off and follow Jesus. But it might be that you hop off and go home. You know, I don't, I don't know. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. And sometimes folks come to church and they're nursed this kind of sinful lifestyle and then it doesn't help them get better. And they need to come to grips with, i, I got to get serious about this, I'm not not serious about this, and they might need to jump off on the other side and just be honest. But I hope, I hope that what we'll do is we'll, we find that place of lukewarmness where we've been standing on the fence, and I hope that today is the day you just, <laughs> you just dive off onto the other side. And I'm going to kind of fade back here. I'm going to ask Jerry to lower the lights so we can have some kind of privacy will be your time alone with the Lord. I'm not watching you. I'm not looking at you. I'm not peering at you. You, you just are alone with the Lord. I'm going to step out of the way, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do His work now, and um, in whatever way.